today's video, we're going over manual therapies of the hip. So manual therapies can be a really nice addition in your patients that have hip pain. In our medical literature, the most common disorders you'll see treated with hip manual therapies are going to be hip osteoarthritis as well as FAI. They can also be nice for your post-op patients, particularly post-op FAI, when they're ready for it and they're still stiff, painful, or lacking range of motion. However, it's just really important to keep in mind that the heavy hitters for your patients are going to be patient education as well as doing some form of exercise. So if you're going to be using manual therapies, just make sure that you include those things in the program. When compared to exercise alone, adding manual therapies to exercise generally gives you better outcomes in the short to medium term, but usually no difference in the long term. However, these techniques still can be very useful for your patients in that short to medium term. In today's video, I'm gonna show you a bunch of manual therapies to help your outcomes with patients that have hip pain. What's up guys, my name is Dan Pope from Fitness Pain Free. I'm a physical therapist and a strength coach. We've helped to make thousands of incredible coaches and clinicians through online courses, mentoring programs, and communities. The goal of today's video is to make you 1% better. Okay, so I have my hip joint right here. We have the pelvis, right? The acetabulum is gonna be the socket. I have my femur, the femoral head, ball and socket joint, right? So one thing thing's is important to keep in mind is that if you look at the acetabulum the socket, it faces a little bit anteriorly, laterally, and inferiorly. So when we're applying our mobilizations, we have to think about that plane. So if I wanna try to mobilize along the plane of the acetabulum, if I wanna do a posterior mobilization, I may have their patient on their back, I may want to go into a little bit of horizontal adduction and push inferiorly, but also a little bit laterally, just to make sure I'm pushing along the plane of the acetabulum. Hip posterior glide, this is largely to improve hip flexion as well as hip internal rotation. Just be careful for your patients that have hip arthritis or FAI. This can be a little provocative, so it just goes nice and slowly, ask a lot of questions, make sure you're not driving through a whole bunch of pain. So your patient's lying on their back. From here, I'm gonna flex them up to 90 if they tolerate it well. And then from here, I wanna deliver a straight uh, posterior force, but I'm also thinking about going a little bit laterally. One of the things I will do if well tolerated is I take the patient into a little bit of horizontal adduction, and then my force is gonna come from my chest right here. And I actually like to try to hold on to the table. When I apply my force, I'm going straight posterior, and I'm actually trying to drive my chest, excuse me, my chest a little bit laterally as well. So comfort is important. If this is hurting you or if it's hurting the patient, you can just take some towels and place it onto the patient's knee so that when you do your mobilization, no one ends up getting hurt in the process. Lateral hip distraction, this is basically a global mobilization, so in theory, it should help to improve range of motion in all directions. I have a belt to mobilize the hip. This is popularized by Mulligan. Sometimes you have to change the length back and forth a few times to so just be patient while you're doing this. Have your patient laying on their back. This leg's gonna be bent to 90. First thing I wanna do is get this belt. It's gonna go behind my hips. It's gonna go around the patient's thigh. And then from here, I'm gonna ask the patient to bring this as close to the hip joint as possible. Now, if this is uncomfortable for the patient, you can take some towels and just place it between the belt and the patient's thigh, all right? From here, I wanna stabilize at the knee. I also wanna to try to stabilize at the patient's pelvis. So I'm gonna feel for the patient's iliac crest. I wanna drop right below that onto the crest, stabilize at the pelvis, stabilize the knee, and then pulling out, getting a nice global distraction. Now I can do repetitions here, or we're gonna have a sustained glide where I just sink back. Hey there, Brosif McJoseph. I hope you like treats, evidence-based treats that is. It's an evidence-based cheat sheet for diagnosing and treating femoral acetabular impingement. Now, not everybody loves searing hip pain right through the front of the hip as much as I do. And if you wanna make any money as a physical therapist, you're gonna have to help patients with this type of hip pain. Trouble is, gotta stay up to date on this condition to know how to treat it properly. And that's where I come in. With this handy dandy little cheat sheet, we'll catch you up to date on the medical literature on femoral acetabular impingement syndrome in under 10 minutes. We go over a lot of good stuff. Definitions, prevalence, incidence, population, anatomy, risk factors, pathophysiology, mechanism of injury, clinical examination, differential diagnosis, and treatments like physical therapy, injections, and surgery. Best of all, this is a free download. I'll leave a link in the description. Go ahead and download it and get your learn on. And now back to this video. Hip caudal glide with hip flexion. Again, we have the belt. The belt is around my waist, it's around the patient's leg, right? From here, I'm gonna get as close as I can to the patient, because this glide is supposed to go straight inferiorly. If I'm on the side, then it's gonna be more of a lateral glide. 
right? From here, I'm gonna go into a little bit of hip flexion and ask the patient, hey, can you put this around your hip joint as far as you can, right? And then my force, I'm trying to go straight inferiorly. So I'm trying to sit backwards so I can get a little bit of pull inferiorly. And once I have that inferior pull, then I can go into hip flexion, all right? Just be cautious with this mobilization because if you're using it with someone who has hip FAI or osteoarthritis, it can be a little bit of provocative in this position. So if the flexion element of this is causing symptoms, you can just do a few inferior mobilizations and or add a sustained glide. If someone's feeling really good, then from here, we can start to add a little bit of hip flexion dynamically. Hip distraction with internal rotation. So again, taking my Mo belt, it's gonna go around the patient's thigh just like this. I'm going to bring the leg up and ask the patient to bring this as close to his joint as he can, right? From here, I want to try to impart a lateral glide. So I'm sitting my butt back, pointing his hip out somewhat. And then from here, I wanna go into some hip internal rotation. So I can hug onto the entire leg this way. I can distract and go into internal rotation just like so, right? So for a lot of patients, they're not gonna handle this really well, particularly FAI and hip osteoarthritis. One of the things I will do to make it tolerated better is I'll take the hip into a little bit of a horizontal abduction, and from here, apply my distraction, my internal rotation mobilization, just like that. Long axis distraction mobilization or manipulation. Essentially, I have my belt. I'm going to flip it, make a figure eight, and I'm gonna take my hands, dive them through, and then from here, I'm gonna grab onto the patient's lower leg, right? So I don't wanna grab onto the heel or the foot, just because if I do a manipulation, I really tug, I might gap the tailor curl joint, the subtalar joint, joint, excuse me, which is not bad, but it might alarm you as well as the patient. So the idea is you wanna make sure you're above the foot, okay? The reason why I have the belt is because we don't wanna rely on the strength of our arms and hands to hold onto this leg. So essentially with the belt, I can lean back and I can apply an inferior global mobilization. Now, before we do the mobilization, we wanna go into slight abduction, extra rotation, and maybe a little bit of flexion. So if you're on a high low table, maybe take the patient, put them down a little bit. What that does is it slacks the ligaments around the hip to get a nice mobilization. So from here, I'm just going to use my body weight, lean back, get a nice pull at the hip joint, and have nice gentle oscillations. And if I want, I can do a manipulation. So essentially, I have the patient take a nice deep breath in, blow out and relax. As they blow out, I'm gonna pull, pull, pull. And then at the very end, high velocity, low amplitude manipulation. Hip medial glide, this one's a little tough to perform, so I'm gonna give you a few substitutions, modifications you can try if you have a patient that's particularly big and have a big leg, or if you're a smaller clinician. Essentially, the patient is sidelined. From here, I'm gonna take this leg, and my goal is to get the leg into about 40 degrees of abduction, right? Once I'm in 40 degrees of abduction, I want to impart a medial glide. So from here, I'm coming straight down just like so, okay? Again, this is tough if you have a really heavy leg. So one of the things you can try is you can get a stool or a chair or something just to make this a little bit easier for the clinician. This here. And then basically I can kind of hop up and apply this medial glide a little bit more easily, just like so. Alternatively, you can have one of your buddies step up onto the table and from here, they can abduct the patient's hip to about 40 degrees and then apply a little bit of a distraction. And then for me, it's actually pretty dang easy to come right in, apply that medial glide. And if you are liking this video, I recommend hitting the like button because it really helps me and helps the channel. Thank you very much. Hip lateral glide for improving a deduction of the hip. We have an Airx pad right here underneath of Emmett's hip. And the thing is, it is basically on his trunk and it stops right at his iliac crest because I don't want to block motion at the hip. And on the underside right here, we have a half roller and this is just underneath of the patient's knee, okay? From here, the patient's gonna flex their knee, excuse me, their hip up to 90 degrees plus. And basically this allows me to get close up into his adductors and my force is gonna be down towards the table just like so. So here, coming up and pressing straight down, mobilize straight towards the table. Relax. So how about dosage for these mobilizations? So A, you can stick to the mobilizations that are going to improve the range of motion that you found was limited for your patient during the initial evaluation. You can also focus on the mobilizations that feel good, right? And you can kind of kick the mobilizations out that feel terrible, because sometimes you actually make the patient worse by trying to mobilize in a direction that doesn't feel good. In terms of how often these should be performed, somewhere between one to three times per week, 
somewhere between six and 12 weeks. Now I took those parameters from a study on hip osteoarthritis, but I also think this is gonna be relevant for FAI patients as well as post-op patients as well. Just make sure when you have a post-op patient, it's okay to perform mobilizations. You don't wanna do this fresh out of surgery when they just repaired that labrum. We don't wanna re-tear it, right? So use your brain, talk to the surgeon, and do what's best for your patient. All right, so now you know a bunch of good manual therapies you can use with your patients. You definitely need to know some good exercises. And we have the video for you. We're gonna leave a link up in the corner. Go ahead and click on that link. And we'll go over exercise prescription for patients that have FAI, a very common hip injury. I'll see you in that video.